Hey, welcome back, everybody. Again, this is the Great Basin National Park Bio Blitz, the Bio Blitz that gets to be in your backyard this year, along with those of us at the park that are collecting. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about Hemiptera, specifically the suborder Heteroptera, and um, this is part two. So we're going to go into some other family groups within Heteroptera. And just so that you know what those family groups are and which ones have been covered in other parts or other videos, we're on part two, so we're going over Nabidae through Ropalids, just four random families we think you might commonly encounter. Again, there are many others. Go beyond these lists, discover some more for sure. All right, so Nabidae or damselbugs. These are a great uh, just family group to know because Damselbugs are incredibly diverse in not only what they look like, what they feed on, um, their benefits just abound. They're an amazing predator in the insect world because, well, humans appreciate them, first of all, because they eat a lot of our pests, but they're also keeping a lot of these ecosystems in check. Um, and they do a beautiful job of it. They're very just articulate. They have these raptorial forelegs that they use to bring in a pest. You can see this one here. See if I can get my laser pointer out. You can see this raptorial leg wrapped around this little larva of some kind, and the proboscis is coming out of its mouth part and pushing, and the stylet pierces that insect, and you just get this crazy, glorious, awful display of predation. It's amazing. Um, so damselbugs are a great group to know because they're helping us out as gardeners and things like that. They do look very similar to assassin bugs or reduvidae, so... Keep that in mind, we're gonna talk about that in a moment, but um, they are unique in the fact that at the end of their hemilytron, there's that wing, membranous portion of the wing that we talked about in the last video. And the cells on the end of that margin of the wing there are closed. They're not connected to the cells up higher in the wing. So that's different from your reduvids. Um, and there's a few other things that we'll talk about as well. Um, usually they have smaller pointier heads than the uh, reduvids or assassin bugs. But very similar from the top. This is looking at a variety of common species here, many of them from this Nabis genus. I love the name Nabidae and Nabis. It just may, it reminds me of nabbing something. You know, it's a good way to remember that. Um, but yeah, a lot of diversity here. And uh, you want to be looking out and knowing how to identify these in your garden because they're usually doing a lot of good for you. Pentatomidae, what an epic legendary family this is. I think they're amazing. They should probably be the most famous family in the world, but that's because I'm biased. I study pentatomids. Um, I actually study the brown marmorated stink bug, so I gotta share that with you for sure. I'm a little bit biased, but um, stink bugs made the list because this family is uh, all over North America, and if you live anywhere in the Intermountain West and you know surrounding states, you've encountered at least a few stink bugs in your time. And uh, they live up to their name. They do emit defensive odors. Not all the time are they bad. Sometimes you get kind of interesting smells like from this rough stink bug where you get almost like a, almost like a candy-like smell. It's awesome. it's very weird. Whereas the brown marmorated stink bug emits more of like a, what people say, like a cilantro type smell. Weird, odd. Um, but they usually have a shield-shaped body, and it kind of has this, like, almost five-pointed situation going on. So that's kind of where the pinta comes from. And they have that very dramatic pronotum and the scutellum here, um, and that shows up again and again. There's that scutellum. Here's the pronotum. Um, and they're, you know, a lot of them look cryptic, like this brown coloration, but if you really get into some of the fact sheets that are online through your local uh, extension agency or go look at a key, um, there's some really obvious things like the brown marmorated stink bug has two white bands on its antennae and the rough stink bug does not. That's a really quick uh, kind of demarcation there. Um, what else can we talk about? Well, they're not all bad. We do have a lot of herbivores uh, the brown marmorated stink bug that I study is definitely an herbivore. It eats many different types of plants. It's another polyphagous insect. And it's actually an invasive to North America. So we're kind of grappling with how to react to its invasion and how to treat it in crops. But then, 
you know, Brachymenae can actually feed on soft-bodied insects as well as plants, so it's almost omnivorous. And then we have, uh, what's a good example? Spine soldier bug. I don't have it on this as a pictured species, but spine soldier bug is an excellent um, predator stink bug that feeds on other insects and is very beneficial in your garden and things like that. So good one to look out for. I think you'll definitely see the rough stink bug, green stink bug when you're out in your backyard. So Pentatoma Day is definitely a family we're going to see some species of this summer. If you want to go look at some common ones to Utah and surrounding states, there's common stink bugs of Utah. I helped write this little fact sheet. Google common stink bugs of Utah, get a better look. A lot of other schools and universities have some great fact sheets on stink bugs too. So do some digging. Reduvia Day. Man, I spent a lot of time. Uh, Reduvia day, assassin bugs. These guys have a cool name. If you're going to have a family name, that's pretty amazing. Assassin bug, wow. And they live up to their name. They're beneficial predators in the fact that they sit and wait and usually pounce upon prey items that are many times pest species of insects in our gardens or uh, backyards. And they insert their proboscis and into this living prey item and start to digest them right then and there and take up nutrients from them, so pretty wild. So to do that, they have a really thick proboscis. You can see in this wheel bug, which is more common in the east. You're not going to see too many wheel bugs out here in Utah or Nevada or anything like that. But yeah, really thick proboscis on that species. But across the board on many of the other species, you do have that thick proboscis as well. And they also have the thick raptorial forelegs used to grasp. A few species and uh, individuals to highlight is the masked hunter. This species has a nymph that covers itself in cryptic like detritus or other materials off the ground. And then as an adult, it has this very dark coloration and um, can look like a few other species, but it's fairly common. So a good place to start in the bio blitz, if you see a reduvid, an assassin bug, try looking up the masked hunter and comparing it to what you're seeing in the field. Bee assassin is another really common one you'll see around the Intermountain West and things like that. It's uh, going after some of the pollinators that come to flowers and things like that. So that's not super great, but it doesn't just eat only pollinators. It eats anything it can really get its hands on. But the bee assassin is pretty common and it's absolutely beautiful. Beautiful red and yellow colorations all over its body. And black. It's, it's cool. One uh, medical entomology side note is the cone nose bug which uh, there are actually a few species in the triatoma genus that are actually kind of referred to as kissing bugs or cone nose bugs. They can actually vector human disease in certain parts of the world. Their range in some of these species actually goes into southern Utah, southern Nevada. So it's good to know what these look like and compare them to other things that might look similar. You can see the striping on the edge of the abdomen here, and um, that's a pretty good place to start, but don't be too alarmed because as you can see, a lot of other assassin bugs and a lot of other insects have that. And so you'd want to look at all the key features and look into the cone nose bug uh, descriptions on online and other resources. But just know that, you know, some of these assassin bugs can hurt you if you pinch them or pick them up in the field. So give them a wide berth probably and just take a photo, it's probably playing it safe. Um, I think I've got some more information on the cone nose as well. Yeah, so this is a great graphic that's been created by, um, it's like PJ Leish there. I make sure to give him a shout out. And uh, you can see that the Western conifer seed bug, another commonly encountered native um, Koreaid, different family altogether, might get mistaken for it. So you want to know your Koreaids. Know that there's this, you know, large leg inflammations on or formations on the tibia with the Koreids, and you don't get that on the reduvids, especially not the cone nose. So yeah, and he goes through and looks at a number of things there. So know what you're looking at and don't freak out. It's probably not the cone nose that's on you. It could be, but be calm and get, go do your research. And if you think you're still in the curious portion of things and you are saying, man, it might be, you probably want to talk to a doctor or a medical professional or a medical entomologist. Um, so I promised you earlier that I would talk about 
how do these assassin bugs look different than the damsel bugs that we talked about? And so a good way to do that is look at head shape. Uh, the assassin bugs that we're talking about for now have this more kind of oval, kind of club-shaped head. And the damsel bugs have a more pointed, smaller, stout head. Um, and you also get this thicker, curved beak with the reduvids. And in the nabids, it's a thinner, more uh, at a slender stylet and proboscis. Also, I was talking about that wing cell difference. You don't get these cells at the end of the assassin bug wings. You do at the end of the damsel bug wings. So, that is cool. Ropalidae. This is a neat family, mostly because we encounter them a lot. And there's really only one species of scentless plant that we see commonly out here in the Intermountain West and greater area, and that's the box elder bug. And I think everyone on this video right now is saying, I've seen way too many of the box elder bugs. And if you haven't yet, you haven't spent enough time outside because in the Western states, box elder bug is pretty famous. Um, but uh, there are more species than just the box elder bug in this family. Unfortunately, they're not exactly as flashy or as large as the box elder bug. Most are smaller, like this species here, brown, more cryptically colored, and on weedy plants, whereas the box elder bug is kind of the exception in this family, where it's on uh, in an arboreal, up in trees, and things like that. Most other species in this family group are going to be on weedy plants, uh, down in lower levels of the ground. One thing to keep in mind is that you'll have more numerous uh, veins in the membranous part of the hemilytrin of the wing here. And when we go back and look at the milkweed bugs, the Lygiids, far fewer veins. So that's a good way to tell them apart because at first they start looking a little similar um, in a lot of other respects. So keep that in mind. It's commonly known that they have less uh, developed scent glands, unlike some of the Koreids that we've looked at. And so that's another related family and that's kind of how they get defined apart from each other. Uh, that's hard for us to tell, though, so you'd have to do some research on that. Um, what else can we say about them? Again, I would go pick up a key if you were going to go into really specific species identification of ropalids. They can be a little tricky. They look like some of the other things that we're looking at. Yeah, and I think that's what we have for you. So I look forward to seeing you in the next video.